Okay, Great. we are now recording. Um, thank you, everybody. Again, this topic for this um, quarter's webinar is GDPR. What is it and what does it mean? Um, Daniel, I'm going to pass the reins over to you. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. Um, so uh, today is uh, summer solstice. It's the, it's the longest day of the year. Uh, my hope is that your experience won't be that this is the longest webinar of the year, <laughs> that um, that you find this to be informative. Uh, data security, we're, we're abundantly aware here at Venza how data security can come across as a pretty dry topic, that it can come across as uh, um, a lot of, either a lot of legalese or a lot of techno um, jargon, and um, hard to get excited about it, hard to uh, um, want to spend any time on the, on the topics at all, but I think uh, what you'll find is that um, ignoring some of the some of the the, um, the trends and some of these new developments, especially around GDPR, it's really not best practices. And uh, um, as hospitality professionals, really we we need to think about um, some of these concepts. So my hope is that it will be it'll be informative. Um, we'll try to uh, try to add some interaction and conversation so that you. Uh, you get your, your questions answered, and um, that it flows relatively uh, easily. So um, we'll start trying to tackle uh, ta tackle the topic of GDPR. Um, and I will uh, I'm going to kind of minimize the chat panel on mine so it, on on my screen so that I can focus on the presentation. So April, please don't hesitate to uh, alert me if there's a question that comes along. Uh, during during this uh, the webinar, I'd like to make it a a, a discussion like conversation, uh, and not so much a didactic presentation. But uh, um, I'll have to rely on you to alert me if somebody has a question. So certainly, the way that uh, uh, cool. So the way that uh, I wanted to present this is um, is really looking at it um, uh, the topic of GDPR based on five questions. Uh, the what is GDPR? Why GDPR? Or why now in particular? Um, where is GDPR enforced? So where does it, you know, for whom does it apply? How does it work? So that, that, that will make up the lion's share of today's uh, webinar. How, how does GDPR work? So some of the components that make up uh, GDPR. And then a little look at some of the organizations that you may be familiar with, others that you may not be familiar with, uh, people, uh, organizations that Venza is working with. Um, so who is involved in GDPR? Who can you look to for more information around GDPR? Um, and kind of a short list of who is involved. So that's going to be the topic uh, or the, the five sections, if you will, uh, the what, why, where, how, and who. Um, to help me with the how, uh, in that in that component, uh, Andrew Smith from uh, Privacy Check is going to jump in. I just yeah, want to mention right. that. Hey, great, Andrew. Glad to hear your voice. So, um, yeah, I'll I'll uh, I'll have uh, bring Andrew here in, in a few minutes to to join on, and talk about uh, some specifics that his organization is is doing and how they address <clears throat> GDPR. Um, just wanted to uh, kind of a shout out to some of our some of our partners and organizations with whom we're working, uh, Jose Medio of Privalis Group. Um, they are a uh, Paris and um, San Francisco-based uh, firm that specializes in GDPR. Our longtime uh, legal team uh, partner, Arnold Golden Gregory, and uh, certainly our friends at Privacy Check. You'll, you're going to hear a lot more uh, from Andrew here in, in a moment. So. Some of our these are some of our uh, contributors to um, to the content that that you'll find in today's uh, today's uh, webinar. All right, top line summary about GDPR. What does the uh, what does it stand for? Uh, GDPR is uh, the General Data Protection Regulation that is uh, that that is uh, now um, has been approved by the European Council and is uh, um, it will be enforced 
this coming year. Uh, it determines, uh, um, so I want to say this, although you might not be familiar with the phrase, there are certain phrases, uh, privacy by design, data protection, impact assessments, data protection officers, um, they are going to become more and more part of our day-to-day our -day vocabulary. Um, the primary objective of GDPR is listed to protect the natural, per, uh, the natural persons in relation to the processing of personal data. So all of those kind of components I mentioned a moment ago and what is personal data and how that protection, this is, these are some of the things I want to uncover during our, uh, our talk today. Um, now, it took about four years of discussion that, uh, that uh, to result in this regulation that is um, that is uh, um, consistent of 99 different articles. It's a hefty legal document. Um, for those of you that suffer from insomnia, it's an option for you. Uh, a couple pages worth of, uh, of uh, GDPR uh, legalese, and um, you, it, it'll surely put you to sleep. Um, but uh, uh, it's a very important document, nevertheless. Um, and one of the things that I want to mention is it replaces uh, the EU Data Protection Directive of 1995. Um, so I want to just draw a quick distinction here uh, for, for government uh, wonks that are out there. Um, and so it replaces that directive. What's the difference between a directive and a regulation? Um, in, in the European Union. Regulations have binding legal force throughout every member state and enter into force on a set date in all member states. So uh, that set date has been established as May 25th, 2018. So we are roughly 330 days away from its enforcement. So that's a regulation. A directive, uh, or directives, they lay down certain results that must be achieved by member states, uh, but each member state is free to decide how to transpose directives into their national laws. So um, this new regulation also comes with uh, new penalties for nonconformance, uh, for noncompliance. Um, penalties can be as much as or greater than 4% of global revenue, global turnover, as they reference uh, for uh, in in Europe, um, or as much as 20 million euros. So the, the penalties are, are substantial. Um, there are some, uh, some uh, examples of organizations that may, that may be um, not required to follow GDPR, uh, such as what, what are termed within the, the document micro-entities. These are organizations that are quite small, uh, less than 250 employees, or or have some other kind of. Uh, they may they may they may just not be uh, not be uh, referenced as a large corporation. But uh, um, most organizations will fall within uh, GDPR. All right, moving on. Legislative summary, just uh, uh, kind of a little bit on. What is this? Uh, what is GDP? Getting staying with this? Uh, what is GDPR concept here, up here? We're still asking the question: What is GDPR? Um, so, GDPR is legally aligned to two different legal documents. Um, there is uh, it is considered a fundamental right, uh, um, and it is aligned to Article Eight of what is known as the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, known uh, kind, of, uh, um, kind of largely known as the Charter. It is also aligned to Article 16 of the Treaty of the, on the Functioning of the European Union. So it, it's tied to two uh, legally, uh, legal legislative documents. Um, it has been translated into 24 languages. It was approved very recently, um, that is the 16th of April, 2017. Um, and so translated last January, approved in April, 
um, and uh, uh, and will be enforced um, uh, on the again on the 25th of May 2018 across all 28 nations of the EU. Oh, and by the way, it took some 751 parliamentary members to uh, approve the uh, uh, the measure. Okay, so that's kind of the legislative uh, political aspect of um, of GDPR. So what is it? Legally, um, uh, it applies to businesses that process and store personally identifiable information. Any information, uh, uh, personal data uh, about data subjects. Um, so who are those organizations? Globally, these are, it's globally applied to any organization processing or storing personal data of EU, to EU citizens. We're going to go into this a little bit. Uh, well, you're going to hear this quite a bit in today's uh, conversation. Um, we've got um, uh, 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 I want to mention also that there are two types of fines for infringement. Um, one of which, as I mentioned kind of a little bit earlier, that is the uh, that's the one that's causing all sorts of uh, um, uh, heartache is the um, is the uh, uh, four million euros for uh, not adhering to core principles or a lesser fine for not adhering to certain requirements. Um, so the uh, the four million, uh, as quoted from Article 44 of of the GDPR, failure to adhere to the core principles of data processing, infringement of personal rights or the transfer of personal data, whereas um, whereas the lower, lesser fine is failure to comply with technical or organizational requirements, um, not conducting impact assessments. One of those terms that I referenced at the top or go a little bit deeper into impact assessments, uh, or breach communications and other such things. I want you to know, I want to note one thing is that um, GDPR is an accountability-based privacy law where controllers or processors of data have a legal obligation to follow the law. Um, this aspect has made GDPR the subject of a lot of attention um, be because it has legal um, uh, ramifications for that controller. So that accountability-based law is, is, is that the fact that it's an accountability-based law is lots of attention. It isn't the world's first. Um, just kind of uh, 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 maybe a trivia point. Canada passed the first accountability-based privacy law um, back in 2002, and in many ways served as a um, as a as a basis for the for the uh, GDPR. Kind of historical context with regards to why now. So we're in the second of uh, second of our five. Why now? Um, this is considered uh, as the biggest change in years, the the most important change in data privacy regulation in 20 years. Why? Because um, there is a much greater effort on compliance following a widely held belief that businesses have not been taking data privacy seriously. Um, so up until this point, there's just a widely held belief that it's um, that it's uh, uh, not enough has been done. Um, the directive that we mentioned before from '95 didn't have there was a lack of uniformity among the uh, among the European states, so it was needed then. And um, so it was back in 2012 the EU Commission proposed the text that is now. You know, some preliminary text that is now um, GDPR, so they've been working on it really kind of about four or five years. And um, and also kind of historically, uh, the, uh, um, the European Court of Justice invalidated the safe harbor privacy principles. That was back in, in uh, November of, gosh, uh, going on two years now. Um, and so... Uh, uh, the, uh, I just want to mention the European Data Protection Supervisor issued an, uh, an opinion uh, um, on the 30th of May of last year stating the privacy shield, which is, um, which is something that is in place now for 
U.S.-based companies that are storing personal data um, as it stands, uh, according to the, the protection supervisor, as it stands is not robust enough to withstand future legal scrutiny before the European court. So just want to make sure, make sure that that's clear. A lot of organizations, uh, uh, North American-based organizations, say, well, GDPR doesn't apply to me because we're following some of the, 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 the uh, storage protocols of U.S. privacy uh, EU US privacy shield. All right, so one thing is in reference to the storage aspect, so the security required around storing, but storing and security is only a part of GDP, GDPR. There's also the privacy aspect of it. That's, that's, so first and foremost, there's, that's kind of two parts of, uh, of, the, of the conversation. And then, um, and then even more importantly, there is uh, a consensus uh, within the the European um, data supervisors, that the privacy the privacy shield as it exists now still won't be enough. Um, so we're in we're in that phase where we're they're looking at privacy shield and wondering what needs to be done in order for it to make make it robust enough to satisfy uh, the strict standards. So that that will re that subject is is certainly not closed. Uh, I. Since you are you are friends of Venza, it's probably I'm probably speaking to the choir, preaching to the choir on this one with regards to the present day circumstances. Cyber attacks, you know, they were up 48% last year. We're seeing one million new malware attacks launched daily. One million is a conservative es estimate. I mean, we've got privacy issues uh, around um, uh, you know situations such as the the Aaron Andrews case, which is uh, which is now you know old news, but still uh, relevant to, to the hospitality industry. Um, and data is, uh, data is, um, big data is here. Data sets are growing rapidly. Um, that's in part because there's an increasing, they are increasingly gathered by cheap and numerous information sensing um, uh, uh, methods. You know, there's in an internet of things, mobile devices, uh, remote sensing from aerial uh, imagery, cameras, etc. So big data, data on on all of us, more and more uh, available, and um, and so these these circumstances around security, privacy, and the, just the capability of storing information about each and every one of us is is um, is so prevalent. So that is. Uh, that is kind of present day circumstances. Why answering the question why now? Moving to the third section um, about where uh, this is something that that a lot of our U.S. and, and Canadian and uh, North American um, Caribbean based organizations are are asking why is this important to us? Um, there is an extra uh, territorial. Scope uh, is outlined in Article 3 of GDPR. Um, so, so in that in that article, it, it lists, and I quote: "This regulation applies to the processing of personal data in the context of the activities of an establishment of a controller or processor in the union, regardless of whether the processing takes place in the union or not." So what organizations uh, outside of the union does it apply to? It applies to non-EU organizations who target or monitor EU data subjects. That's, those, are, those are individual citizens. And non-EU organizations who process personal data about EU subjects in connection with other with data or, and or transactions. Um, and so anyone offering goods or services um, it, it is more than just mere access to their website or an email address, address but might be evidenced by the use of language um, uh, that might be used in generally in, in one or more of the member states. So if, you, if your website is, is catering to, um, to, to a, 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 a national group within the union. Um, or uh, 
And so if they are there to order, order goods or services, um, monitoring customers or users who will be, uh, who are in the EU. So if, any, if there's any monitoring of their behavior, um, for example, where individuals are tracked on the internet by techniques which apply to profile or enable decisions to be made, uh, based, uh, uh, made or predicted based on personal preferences. So in any way does that, does a controller processor, and this is the term that they use in GDPR, envisage offering services to the data subjects, um, or to data subjects in one or multiple um, member states. If, if they are, then de definitely GDPR applies. So if any way, uh, a, a loyalty program or uh, um, the, simply the website of a hotel, if it is looking to, to uh, convert visitors to become, to book uh, a room, then GDPR certainly applies to you. Um, and uh, uh, so yes, monitoring of behavior is included. A quick note, the data subject, him or herself does not actually have to offer payment for that good or service for it to be, for you to be considered um, within GDPR. So you don't, they don't have to actually engage in tr a transaction with you, um, but rather if, if, if you are simply offering it. Also on the subject of where in terms of processing uh, scope, um, one of the key changes in GDPR is that the data processors have to uh, have, have direct obligations, direct obligations for the first time. So if you're a processor, if you're a controller of data, you have obligations. Again, this is an accountability-based privacy model or privacy law. Um, so these include the following. You, uh, you must maintain a written record of pro uh, pro uh, processing activities. Um, you have to designate a data protection officer. I'll go into the greater details on what, what a DPO is. You have to um, appoint a representative uh, if you are not in the EU. And you have to provide um, notifications um, in the case of, uh, of a data breach um, and do so without delay. Um, the provisions on cross-border transfers also applies to controllers or processors. So, in other words, uh, the new law will extend outside the EU. This will uh, especially affect e-commerce companies or organizations that have cloud cloud-based businesses. Um, for international transfers, for those cross-border transfers, there are a few options that organizations will need to to consider with regards to the storage of, of information. Privacy Shield, as I've mentioned, is one of them. Um, uh, contractual clauses with, uh, with another entity, a EU-based entity. Um, things called binding corporate rules. Uh, this is a five-step uh, uh, um, five process in order to get a, a corporate rule established between entities from the EU and outside of the EU or derogations, which is kind of nullified based on some certain um, criteria that the organization may, may uh, be able to satisfy, being very small or something like that. Um, so uh, for the sake of time, I was going to reference exactly what uh, some of the details around cross-border uh, cross transfers, but for the sake of time, I'll just jump that. But um, uh, on the subject of binding corporate rules, uh, the creation and establishment will pr uh, very likely present a big challenge for organizations in the, in the early days um, in order to be compliant to GDPR. It is an, it an involved process, about five steps, as I've mentioned. Um, so a lot of new, uh, the, the role of the, the data processor and their importance and this accountability is, is likely going to make a big impact. Um, on, on matters addressing supply and, and commercial agreements. So this is something that, that organizations will definitely have to be taking, um, taking into consideration. Wanted to note in terms of one last thing on this processing scope, um, the definition uh, of personal data. So the definition of person, personal data in GDPR 
has been expanded. Under the old directive, that 90, 1995 directive, personal data uh, determined, determined as information about any identified or identifiable natural person. However, under GDPR, the definition of personal data will cover online identifiers, this is the term that they use, um, or any other factors specific to an individual's physical, physiological, genetic, mental, economic, or cultural, social identity. So um, they could be cookies, cookie identifiers, um, radio frequency identity, tags, uh, you name it. So they've expanded that. Given the world we have uh, today, very different than 95 when it comes to things such as the Internet of Things and wearables, um, the, the idea of um, uh, personal data has certainly expanded. All right, I'm in the how space uh, of our conversation. So um, now we're, we're getting into some of the specific term terminology that um, that hopefully you'll become more and more familiar with. One of the things I mentioned right at the top of the of the webinar is the, the concept of privacy by design. Um, so it, it's nothing new. Um, it has always played a part of their, of their data directives, um, but with the new law, it's principles of minimizing data collection and retention and gaining consent from co uh, consumers when processing data. Uh, it, it's much more formalized. Um, and again, I've got, I've got the actual quote with regards to privacy by design, but uh, I'll, I'll skip over that for the sake of time. Um, but uh, uh, the idea of Adopting policies, um, internal policies, implementing measures um, to, uh, to, to, to secure data and to provide greater privacy. Um, and so some of those measures, uh, pseudonymizing, transparency and, 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 and transparency and monitoring. And, and it references in GDPR, and I quote, a pseudonymizing Minimizing personal data as soon as possible, transparency with regard to the functions and processing of personal data, and enabling the data subject to monitor that data processing, enabling controllers to create and improve security features. So a number of different measures that organizations have to make in order to, uh, to satisfy a GDPR protection model, um, where you can see that data controller has a lot of weight uh, on their shoulders with regards to, uh, you know, the security of, of the data processing, their duties to the data subjects themselves, the rights that the data subjects have with regards to uh, consent. Um, if it involves third-party organizations, um, that is certainly part of the loop as well. So another big concept, con uh, component of, uh, of GDPR is the data protection impact assessments. Um, they must be con uh, conducted by controllers. Um, uh, it, is, uh, it is something that it evaluates the processing operations with, with, and the focus is really all about high risk, um, sensitive information. Information that, will, that, that if gotten out may affect the rights and the freedoms of natural persons as they, as they reference, so data subjects. Um, it, uh, uh, an assessment must, must contain a description of the system, uh, an assessment of, uh, of proportionality of the, of the information. So is the information, the, the, the data that they have, that you have proportional to the need um, and the, the reason you, you asked for it in the first place? Assessment of risks around security, and then, um, then measures that, that are seen to address risks, so safeguard measures, security measures, what kind of mechanisms are in place to, pro uh, to protect that data um, and to make sure that, that people are, um, are aware of, um, people on your team are aware of the processing and the, and the protocol. All right, another big term, data protection officer. You, you hear a lot about this. Um, the insertion of the data protection officer role in a GDPR is, is super important. The need uh, for DPOs is huge and concerning uh, um, among experts right now. Uh, there's an, uh, the expectation of, they estimate some 28,000 
DPOs will be needed um, to satisfy GDPR in year one. So uh, organizations around the world are scrambling to, to be able to satisfy that need. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how what's being done in, in, in hospitality on that front. Um, but what is a data protection officer? First of all, their expertise should be commensurate with the complexity of the organization. So if it's a very large organization with a lot of data, a lot of sensitive data, um, the, the, the DPO should be relatively, uh, should be quite savvy. Um, very different than an organization that has very little data. Um, but regardless, DPO uh, necessary. Um, uh, in terms of their requirements, what is required of a, uh, of a data protection um, officer? They have to understand GDPR. They have to understand the business sector and the needs around the, uh, of that business um, or that controller that, that has designated them to be the DPO. And then thirdly, they have to understand the information systems um, uh, uh, of, of that data processor. I personally find that these three different uh, requirements is kind of a un, uh, unique bag. I'm hoping that across the, the globe, it's not uh, a, a, a unicorn that people are looking for because if you, if you break it down, understanding GDPR is really kind of understanding the legal aspects, understanding the business uh, controller's business sector is, is, the, is the business need of that, of that organization, and then there's a very technical aspect of the DD, uh, DPO's role. So somebody that's technical, understands the legal aspects as well as business and managerial needs operations. Um, those, are, those are three different skill sets that uh, to be able to find in a single individual could be, uh, could be challenging. Um, so what do they do? Their tasks are to collect information about and uh, to identify processing activities. They analyze and check the compliance of processing. They inform, advise, and issue recommendations uh, to the controller and or processor um, to, uh, um, you know, if, if, there is, if there is a concern. I'm getting a notice that there are some audio challenges. Am I still being heard, April? You are loud and clear, sir. All right. Um, so I want to make sure that we're clear, though. The monitoring of compliance does not make does not mean that the DPO is personally responsible where there is an instance of noncompliance. The GDPR makes it clear that, the, that it is the controller, not the DPO, who is required to implement an appropriate technical and operational um, uh, measures. So some of the considerations around DPO is that they have, they have given appropriate resources to do their job. Um, they have involvement in the issues pertaining to data protection. Um, they act in an independent manner. Their, um, their penalty and dismissal uh, uh, is, is as, as, an employer or con as an employee or contractor of the data processor is not based upon their findings as a DPO um, and uh, trying to eliminate any conflict of interest so that they're not just rubber stamping stuff for the benefit of the organization. So this is it's a very important uh, component of, um, of uh, GDPR. Big, big part of GDPR is the, really the uniformity of, um, of data breach notification. Data controller has 72 hours to notify the DPO of, um, of, uh, of a breach. In serious breaches, uh, is it, they are also required to notify the data subjects themselves. Um, yeah, it's really um, in, in terms of data, data breach notification, really not unlike a lot of uh, guidelines that are out there like the ICO, the UK ICO, um, or some of, the no some of the notification requirements around PII in uh, 48 of the U.S. states. So it's not uncommon, um, uh, but it's certainly, they certainly didn't leave it out. So notification is, is an important component. All right, I want to move on to, uh, to consent. This is, uh, um, this is a huge aspect of, uh, of GDPR. Um, so consent is one of the several means of making processing legitimate. Consent has to be given freely. Um, it, uh, uh, 
from the data subject. The purpose of processing uh, of their personal data must be as easy to withdraw as it was to give their consent. So consent must be explicit when it comes to sensitive information. Um, and the data controller is required to be able to demonstrate that consent was given. Existing conditions may still uh, still work, but only um, only provided. So if there, if, I'm sorry, existing consent, if consent has already been given, may still apply. Um, but they, that'll only be the case if they meet some of the new con conditions. So it must be clear. There must be a clear affirmative act that they do in terms of giving consent. They must give it freely. Um, and they must be informed of the indication of, of, of the of processing that their, their data will, their information will be used. And it has to be easy to withdraw. They have to, they have the right, what they're calling the right to, uh, to erasure, the right to be forgotten. You have to allow people an opportunity to, uh, um, to be forgotten. And at this point, I'm going to take a sip of my tea and, um, and drive the uh, the uh, the uh, PowerPoint oh. here for okay. Andrew. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for for passing that off there. Hope you're enjoying your tea. Um, my name's Andrew. I work for Privacy Check, uh, and Daniel asked me to talk a little bit uh, about the hows of implementing uh, GDPR compliance. So I'm earlier. Uh, he was talking about policy, the fact that you need to do a privacy impact ass assessment, uh, sign a DPO, but uh, you may need some actual technology to prove this accountability, not unlike uh, Hansel and Gretel dropping breadcrumbs, which is what you're looking at here. So uh, hopefully Daniel can go to my next slide here. And uh, this kind of describes uh, the principles of accountability you're going to want to uh, to follow and, and what the technology that, that uh, I work on actually deals with. First being lawfulness uh, and transparency, that's one of these GDPR principles. Uh, for example, if you're relying on legitimate interest for legality of processing, you're going to want to provide a, a notice uh, and demonstrate that your organization has uh, done the appropriate uh, uh, looking into the, uh, the fact that your legitimate interests uh, are not trumping the data subject's legitimate interest. If we'll go to the next slide, uh, there's a little bit on purpose limitation. That's the concept that uh, your organization is only collecting the personal data from your customers, from your data subjects that you're actually using. You're not hoarding this data for some nefarious purpose. We'll go to our next slide. We'll talk about uh, data minimization. Once you've used some personal data, maybe a, a credit card number or uh, any other kind of personal data that you no longer need, you're going to want to get rid of that, whether that's deleting it or uh, anonymizing it. Both of those kind of fall within the data minimization uh, layer or kind of uh, 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 directive. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And then we'll go on to, uh, you're going to want to uh, be accurate when it comes to uh, your data subject's personal data. Make sure it's up to date. Make sure it's not fallacious. Next, we'll go on to uh, storage limitation, right? Uh, make sure that you delete personal data uh, that uh, isn't needed anymore. Uh, that's a, a little bit on the data minimization side as well, just the, the fact that we're, we're getting rid of this data, but uh, this particular bit is about de-identification, that uh, uh, one way of deleting data is by basically removing all the markers that would identify a personal uh, a, a person in, in the data. One more slide, we're talking about data integrity. That's making sure that your data isn't accidentally lost or compromised. Uh, this is really on the security side. Uh, Daniel and his group are, are, are very good at helping you guys with that. And if we'll go on to the next slide, we're talking about uh, confidentiality. So you want to make sure that only qualified people within your organization are interacting with this personal data. That it's just not free and clear for anyone uh, to, to, to look at. And, and 
uh, if we go on to the next slide, that, that becomes, again, one of these breadcrumbs that uh, you'll want to drop so that any time uh, a, a employee within your organization looks at that data, it's, it's logged. You want to log when your customers see a privacy notice, uh, whether that's just in time as they're entering that data or within a month if the data is being collected in another way. You want to collect the, the, the version of that notice. Sometimes privacy notices change. Uh, you want to collect whether they've given consent or whether you have a contract on file or, or whether you're collecting the personal data under a, a different basis of processing. Um, every time that personal data is processed, you'll want to drop a, a breadcrumb so that you could prove to a supervisory authority that in fact you did have uh, a legal standing to do so. Uh, and of course, once personal data is deleted, you'll want to uh, log that fact because uh, that way you can prove that you in fact uh, have gotten rid of that personal data. So uh, tell you what, I I'm going to ask to take over the screen if I could and I'm actually going to show you what this might look like uh, on, I, I was going to say the real world but uh, it's uh, kind of a, a, a fake world. This is a a demonstration of a hotel, the, a fake hotel called Resort Inn. Uh, Daniel, can you see that? Can you see my screen here? Yep. I'm not just whistling Dixie, which is good. So we, we all have screens like this. These are, these are websites. Uh, they collect a, a certain amount of personal data, and I guarantee you, come May of 2018, the first place that these supervisory authorities will look to see if uh, organizations are compliant, it, it's going to be their website. It's going to be their uh, outward facing uh, contacts that they can just uh, roll up on and uh, you know maybe even fill out a contact us form like this. So whenever a, a user is actually sharing some of this personal data like this, you'll want to log that. Uh, including the uh, the fact that you've shown your data subject, you've shown your um, uh, your customer, or at least offered your customer a, a privacy notice, so they can get a, a look at uh, why they should uh, share their personal data with you, what personal data is collected, and why, how long you hope to hold that data for, uh, who it may be shared with, and why. Uh, any cookies you might select because, of course, as Daniel mentioned, now uh, any sort of unique identifier could be seen as personal data. Uh, a description of the data subject's rights under the law and, of course, you're going to want to link to any full privacy policies that uh, you may have on file. So we've shown that. You're going to get consent or if you're processing under a different basis, uh, it, you might be uh, collecting the fact that you're entering into a contract. Uh, that's up to you and, and your law firm, but you are going to want to cl uh, collect the breadcrumb, collect the fact that uh, the data subject has given this information and, and record it. Because later, uh, a data subject may ask to uh, exercise their rights under the law, which is uh, an, another piece of the puzzle that you're going to want to deal with and, and whether that is uh, creating a, a portal out of whole cloth like uh, we provide here at uh, Privacy Check where a data subject could return and, and see the actual notice that they gave their consent to and uh, perhaps exercise their rights, right? Whether that's the right to erasure or the right to actually access that personal data. Uh, you want to give them the ability that way, or um, if uh, maybe your organization already has a sort of portal, let's see if I go to the rewards section of this website, I can actually sign up for uh, the, the uh, rewards section. Uh, all right, let me just skip to the, the end. Daniel, if I was smart, I would have had this all pre-filled pre out, wouldn't I have? And here again, we can get to the notice 
but uh, I'm going to sign for this, and uh, here we go. We're in we're in the, the the rewards section of Resort Inn, and these breadcrumbs could be baked right into here, uh, as well as any sort of um, a granular consent you might be asking your data subjects for, you, your customers for, like um, uh, maybe the fact that they have a, a young child uh, or that maybe they're handicapped so they want to be close to the elevator or, or they smoke. Uh, these are little bits of uh, preferences which could also be seen as uh, consent and, and of course you need to give data subjects the ability to exercise their rights uh, including the right to be forgotten which could just be, you know, close my account. I'm, I'm done with resort in holding my personal data. So uh, with that, Dan, I'll, uh, I'll turn the uh, presentation back to you. I think I can do that like this. Very good. April, can you? All right. You have it now. So, um, so the reference to Hansel, Hansel and Gretel, um, how, did that turn out well for them in the end? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, well, I guess it depends what version of the uh, the story you're you're reading. Whether they get cooked by the the the, uh, the, witch, or not. the witch at the end, or whether they find their way home. Yeah, but you're right. I, uh, actually, I guess in some telling, someone's eating the breadcrumbs, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in terms of, and also following along with the finding your way home, we we're wrapping up uh, last couple of last couple of uh, slides here, and we'll try to get some time for for conversation. So. Five, the fifth of the of the five questions: um, Who who is uh, involved, uh, especially with uh, hospitality? Um, uh, you know, again, currently you can imagine there's a lot of activity around GDPR. Um, for organizations that cater to hospitality specifically, um, uh, organizations such as FD, uh, HFTP are involved. Uh, they've created a task force, for example, to uh, to formulate. Um, a hospitality data protection officer certification for hospitality uh, program. Uh, I personally have the honor to be selected as a member of that task force, so that's kicking off um, this summer. Uh, organizations such as Provalis and AGG, uh, again, working with Venza, they're active in GDPR. Um, uh, Venza also is further, uh, further enhancing our role as an international leader in data security. Uh, we've expanded uh, our organization by opening an office in The Hague, Holland. The Hague, uh, for those that don't know, is, is distinguished as a global seat uh, for peace and justice. Um, they've established something called the Data, the Hague Security Delta, or HSD. It is Europe's number one security cluster, and, uh, um, and so Holland is certainly, is clearly a place to be for all things GDPR, and we're glad to be a part of that. And last but not least, um, our friends at Privacy Check. Uh, this is something I took from their from their website, working to demystify privacy and security for customers and businesses alike. So, their solutions like uh, Consent Check, as you got a as got a window into seeing, um, they're allowing GDPR users uh, user consent compliance. So, thank you so much, Andrew, and our friends at Privacy Check. Yeah, thank you. So this is kind of you know GDPR in a nutshell with regards to its personal data, its protection by design, or, or um, the uh, uh, data protection officers, breach protection, uh, rights to be forgotten, some of the uh, overall topics uh, that are or co components that are part of GDPR. I know we're kind of right at the top of the hour, but uh, um, I'll stay on if there are any questions from uh, from folks, and I'll open my my chat window too at this point. Um, any questions that, that came up? Um, anything that uh, that you saw that you want to hear more about, understand a little more deeply? Uh, anything April uh, by chance? It's, it's I do have one thing um, for those that are joining on the call from our, our properties um, around the states and possibly in, in some other countries. Um, don't forget that this webinar does count towards an annual MX credit required for CHTP and CHAE certifications. So don't forget that we do these um, quarterly. Um, please come back for more information on other topics. But don't forget about those certifications that you can get continuing edu education credits for. Um, Daniel, you're more than welcome to elaborate on that, but that's the only thing I had to add. 
Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. If there are any questions, for those of you that are attending High Tech next week, uh, certainly Venza will be there. Love to see you uh, visit our booth, uh, 1023, right, April? That is correct. We will be there. We will be very, very orange. So you will yeah. not miss us. Um, I have I have the pleasure to present a tech talk on GDPR. Um, that is on Tuesday. Uh, uh, Jose Medio, as I mentioned from Pirvalis, will be speaking on Wednesday afternoon um, on a, a real deep dive into the data protection officer role. Um, and also we have our security boot camp, so that's looking at data security as as a, as a whole. Uh, that is uh, from 8 to 11 on on Monday. So if you're going to high tech, um, uh, lots of opportunities to uh, uh, to learn more about what's happening in data security and on the subject of GDPR. And always, uh, well, you're you're welcome at uh, at our booth. We'd love to love to certainly see you there. Um, Absolutely. Any questions? Did any anyone have any? There's a lot of information we threw at you. Hope hopefully. Uh, um, I've fulfilled my commitment not making it the longest, the longest webinar of the year. Certainly not, Daniel. Um, so I did not see any questions come through our questions box um, related to the topics, um, nor the chat box. But I do want to remind everybody, um, folks that maybe couldn't attend that were on your team, you will be sent out a recording of this. It will also be available on our website. You're more than welcome to access it. If there are questions that come up in regards to GDPR um, in the next few months and you think, oh gosh, you know, I remember Vinza had a webinar on that, feel free to use that as a resource or come directly to us and our team. You all know me um, from our success team. And so please bring those data security questions to our team and we will definitely be there to respond to those. Um, other than that, um, Andrew, again, thank you for your time today. Daniel, thank you for thank your you. time. I'm going to go ahead and close out the um, webinar, guys. Thank you so much for attending, and we will speak with you all again in Q3, if not before. Thanks, everybody.